No. No, what she's no. saying is how can a union make you join? Oh, well, union. Oh, well. Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, I mean, so you're saying how can a union make yeah. you join the union? Yeah, like how is it that, like how is it legal? How is it? It's legal? contractual. Like in the in the contract that the union sign. Well, first of all, in the legislation in a state, closed shop unions become legal, right? And then in the contracts, when a union goes into a company and negotiates a contract, it is in the contract that they have to do it. So it's contractual, right? So essentially, when you agree to work, you are agreeing to abide by that contract. You don't have to work. You know, you can choose not to work there. Yeah. So from that perspective, there's choice. Yeah. I mean, you know, they made me take a drug test and had an FBI background check to become a, to become a teacher. Well, if I was a you know, serial killer, I could choose not to be a teacher. <laughs> So, from that perspective, not making me do something. Well, aren't most places though like that? Like in, I mean, aren't most aren't most companies closed shop in places where you're allowed to be? Most places, um, most places that are not right to work states, they're they are a closed shop. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I'm saying. So it's kind of like fake choice. Maybe. Like, um, although, that. from my little socialist, that's an interesting perspective. I know. I feel weird. Um, I don't. I will tell you this, closed shop unions allow for more powerful unions. And the Republicans in, in Michigan aren't stupid. They're doing this for political reasons. Because unions vote Democrat, and unions are powerful organizers of Democrat vote, and they're taking away Democrat vote. Um, now, they're going to argue the freedom um, perspective. And, and from some perspective, they're right. I mean, they're not wrong about what they're saying, but the union people aren't wrong either. The problem is both of them have a point, right? Um, in fact, in most arguments, both sides have a, a, a legitimate point. And the fiscal cliff, not, um, both sides have legitimate points. So, I don't know what to tell you about that. Um, I know what I think, although I'm not going to talk about it because it's not, it's not appropriate. But, um, well, it's just, like, it just seems weird that it's, that it's constitutional is more of my, not that like, it should or shouldn't be, but just that, it, just that you're allowed, that you're allowed. Yeah, like, yeah, and that's one of the reasons why unions were... Because they're so much different, and, and they seem almost extra legal on some regards. Yeah. But their organizing principle became such a powerful uh, political motivating factor that they gained some rights that maybe otherwise you would have thought they couldn't have <coughs> because they worked collectively. The power, the power of many, is pretty impressive when they actually are organized. Um, actually, what I'm best at in history is union, is labor history. Um, I don't like doing it because it's sort of depressing, um, and. No one uh, around here, like if I was going to get a PhD and then I had to go to like like to Michigan or to like, Wisconsin or Minnesota, and I don't want to do that. But um, it's really it's really interesting. It speaks a lot about our country so where we're going. You, as a teacher, you guys have to join. Actually, no, Kentucky, we don't have to. Um, the KEA, the KEA is um, open. You don't have to join it if you want to. You can't. You don't have to. Um, I'm in the KEA, honestly. For two reasons, um, it's run very, very poorly. Um, the decision making is not impressive um, from the state level. I'm in it for two reasons. Number one, it provides by being in the KEA, it does provide you with extra insurance if some kid randomly sues you. And also, I feel that my grandfather would haunt me if I wasn't in a union. So every year, my wife. Yeah, those are closed shop unions, and those are powerful unions too. Um, but part of the reason why those are powerful unions, especially the, the pilot union, is because they're highly skilled. Yeah, I knew he was a pilot, and so it, that's highly skilled. It's not like you can bring a scab in, a bunch of scabs in to fly 747s. Right? What are you doing, Spanky? Pump me in! It's mostly computers anyway. To be fair, it is mostly computers, but if something goes wrong, you know. Now they have computers that take off and land. Really? Yes. You ever seen the Simpsons episode where the trucker was run by... Um, Help. No. Um, <laughs> all right, let's talk about more progressive reforms. I want to sort of go through these really quickly, all right? Um, Louis Brandeis, what do we know Louis Brandeis from? The social, the social argument guy for um, modern Oregon and stuff. He becomes the first Jewish Supreme Court justice, which again is kind of ironic because um, Wilson is a relatively... Um, I wouldn't go towards that big of an anti-Semite, but he's definitely racist, and putting a Jewish guy on the bench is interesting. But he puts Louis Brandeis on the bench. Um, the Federal Highway Act is 
passed in 1916. This is cr using government funds to create more highways as cars are becoming increasingly important. And we're going to talk a lot more about the automotive industry, but the amount of roads that were added to our country in a very short time was crazy. And this is also putting roads not just in cities, but in more rural areas too. And so this is highly progressive, because don't more roads lead to more infrastructure, and this leads to more opportunity for lower class people, right? Lower class people like Andrew. Federal. Do you, uh, like, does, does the federal like charge of building roads now? Federal government is in charge of federal or national roads, like interstates. Um, now, like let's say Highway 127, that's a that's a fed, that's a, a national highway. But if they're going to be doing repairs, they sometimes will give states grant blo like blocks of money to do highway repair construction. Sometimes the states do it. it. It sort of depends on what the road is and what the federal government's done. Um, but usually, not not all roads. Like if they wanted to fix Main Street, that is a local, that's a local problem. Um, if they wanted to fix I sixty four, that is that's federal money or should be federal money. Um, now the state might be the one who contracts it, but they're most likely are using money the federal government has given them to do it. Okay, um, workman's compensation. What does workman's compensation mean? Yeah. So if Trinity's at her job um, as a, whatever Trinity's going to be when she gets older. All right, a nun. All right. At her job as a nun, um, Trinity slips on a banana peel because, as we've been taught, banana peels are terribly slippery. And she falls and she breaks her arm while you're out. And well, you probably nun while you're broken arm. If you have a broken back and you can't nun, um, then the uh, you know whoever will pay you. So you're 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 paid for being hurt on a job. I mean, you're not paid that much. But what is this in reaction to? People getting unsafe work conditions. Yeah, unsafe work conditions. Well, you read the jungle. What happened to you when you got hurt? You lost your job. And so people are calling for change because oftentimes, is it your fault that this machine cuts off your whatevers? No. No. So you're getting workman's compensation. This also will be undone in the 1920s. What? Who, who was. Supreme Court loaded with um, ultra, not even conservatives, with reactionary conservatives. I mean, they, these people are making like Scalia look like FDR. Um, all right, another one I want to talk about is child labor. Now kids, kids who are ten can't work if they want to. Darn it, Mr. I know. I mean, if you're a four-year-old and you really want to work in a mine, there are laws now saying you can't. So to get to marry, what if you want to work? The government can't tell you what you can't do. Well, apparently they can. If you're a nine-year-old and you want to work 20 hours in a mine, they won't even let you. Well, so now that that's decreased all the Mr. Sayers. Um, I'm age 10. Do what? When this law was the minimum. No, the minimum age was much higher. That was like four or 15 or 16. Um, this was also overturned in the 1920s, um, and there will be child labor coming back, although not at the same level as it was before. And then obviously in the 1930s, the FDR fixes all the problems, um, or at least that's how you're going to hear it in my class. Um, all right, another one, prison reform. Instead of punishing them severely, let's start working at reforming them so there's not as high what's called a recidivism rate. What is recidivism? Does anyone know? Yeah, so you don't just commit more crimes, right? So um, this is also going along with the social gospel movement, right? Like trying to help people on earth who are most disadvantaged. So you get prison reform. Minimum wages, which by the way is also overturned um, eventually. But minimum wage laws are passed um, in certain areas. Not all, not all um, businesses are forced on this, but certain businesses are. Um, and this was overturned um, in a Supreme Court decision later on. And then again, what, what president? Adams? FDR. Right. FDR was the one who finally gave minimum wages for all people in 1937. There is. And it's, it's probably, it's probably, that's awesome. Don't worry. I know. I'm excited for it. Uh, all right, and let's talk about Supreme Court and Progressive Era. We've actually talked about Lochner versus U.S. before. Lochner versus, I'm sorry, Lochner versus New York. We talked about Lochner versus New York before, and this was an anti-labor um, 
decision because um, New York had passed laws regulating hours and regulating um, businesses and how they can treat their workers. This was overturned. The businesses as people can make their own decisions. Um, we also um, you need to talk about Atkins versus Children's Hospital. This is the Supreme Court decision that overturns um, uh, minimum wage laws. Because a business has the right as an individual to set their wages or whatever they want to, and you can choose to work there or not. Again, going to Mary's point, if, if your point about labor can be answered, then we can't have minimum wage laws either because a business is one make you pay for two dollars an hour, you don't have to work if you don't want to. Yes, Atkins sound like the worst person ever. Atkins versus children's hospital. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Atkins versus kids with cancer. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, that is that would be historically a bad place to be. It's like it sounds like the worst moral wrestling match ever. <laughs> Yeah, it's like the Titanic when the rich guy got in the boat and then pushed away the daughter, you know. That's awesome. Or sad. Whichever way we're going for. Um, Schneck versus U.S. is also going to be really important. We're going to get to this a lot more when we talk about World War I, though. So this is essentially saying that you can limit free speech. Um, what You can. I mean, it makes sense. Um, this happened during World War I, and again, we're going to get to it a lot more during the World War I unit after Christmas. But um, essentially what happens is this guy was passing out anti-war leaflets and stuff. And yeah, we're talking about this in government. And he's passing these out, and he got arrested <laughs> for doing this. And what they said, in fact, what Olive Wendell Holmes Jr. said was, you, obviously, you, you can limit free speech. The First Amendment isn't you can say whatever you want whenever you want to. Leah just can't stand up and say, Mr. Sayre, in five seconds, I'm shooting you in the head. You can't say that. Nor has he used the argument, he said, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. That was the argument that he used. Because it leads to what's called a clear and present danger to imminent threat of violence. Right? Do what? Yeah, because in doing so, he argued that during a time of war, it could lead, because... Times of war were different in terms of how people saw anything and could lead to problems. Now, today we would say that probably was a little bit of an overreach, but the larger takeaway is that free speech is meant for people who have minority opinions to be able to express those opinions without fear of being arrested, right? If I think abortion is awesome, I should be able to yell it at the top of my lungs and say it's awesome, right? Or if I think the death penalty is the greatest thing ever, I should say it. And if people don't like it, I'm protected by the First Amendment. The First Amendment doesn't protect you from going up and verbally assaulting people. Right, but how did the man who was just passing the anti-war, how was that? Because they said that because there was such a strong sentiment of like um, against this guy, that he caused a physical confrontation and he purposely did that. Um, that, that, that what he I'm sorry what he did was provocative it wasn't now had he been out there saying I'm against the war that's one thing but he was being provocative now I think it was probably an overreach and today you definitely can do that but you have to put into context just what we've gone through in terms of anti there wasn't there wasn't the kind of anti-war sentiment that we're open about today back then the World War One was not universally supported it wasn't but Many of the people who were not supporting it then were vocal, weren't necessarily popular people. They were like socialists, right? And, and those people weren't always well loved um, in certain circles. That's the like story today. I feel like socialists weren't ever loved. Socialists? I feel like the whole time they, they, just, they just keep trying, they just keep trying, trying. There you go. Um, they just, they just, they just, they just okay. Get well. All right, last thing. Let's talk about the Brandeis brief. Again, we've talked about the Brandeis brief. Um, the Brandeis.